Hello everyone. Welcome to my YouTube channel. In this interview, I discuss my teaching approach to the work of Jando Masuero. And I wanted to give a little bit of a background to this particular interview. A little while ago, Jean Doe posted a video of a number of Alexander teachers, and I was one of them. And he has a particular approach to the Alexander technique. And very kindly, I was given the right of reply, the right of response to his way of working. Jean Doe works hands off. So if he's meeting face to face, it's still hands off with instructions, verbal instructions. And of course on Zoom, it's based on verbal instructions. It's a particular style of work that Jean Doe understands as the early Alexander before he started putting hands on people around 1907. And of course, my understanding of Alexander takes into consideration the evolution of Alexander's work up to 1955 when he died. And I still see the Alexander workers evolving after that. And so this interview is an opportunity for me to reply to a number of questions from Kevin, who arranges Jean Doe's YouTube channel. And I was very happy to be invited to give an honest response to my understanding of the Alexander technique in contrast to the work of Jean Doe. If this raises any interesting questions, I'd be very happy to talk a little bit more about it at a later time. One of the main contrasts between our way of work is that Jean Doe is particularly interested in the angles, the degrees between various relativities of the postural forms between the neck and the head and the neck and head and the back. And you may say, well, am I interested in these things at all? Are these different shapes and postures and patterns relevant to my understanding of the Alexander technique? And I would like to say that actually they're not irrelevant and I'll explain why. For me, the, the human organism reacts and adapts throughout life. And a person's shape at a particular time of life, their postural shape, their, the shape of their spines, where their shoulders rest, is a function of their history. And so, yes, the shape is relevant. It's relevant as a barometer of how they've coped with the demands of living, which can include accidents, injuries, and even can go back as far as birth, where we all can be born with different shapes and sizes and variations of form. So for me, the body shape isn't something to be changed directly because in, in fact, it's evidence of our reactions to our histories. The way I understand the Alexander technique is that its primary aim is to change my ongoing responses and reactions to life events 
so that I don't keep on reinfor reinforcing postural disturbances and deviations and distortions so that my form can readapt, readjust and recalibrate to its best advantage. And that takes time. So I'm not interested in changing the shape or the form or the relativity of my parts directly. But those very things will change as a result of my prevention of the habits that have created those shapes in the first place. So I want to emphasize, I'm not against the observation of shape and the quality of the postural mechanisms, nor the quality of movement. But I don't see them as primary. I don't see them as the essence of the work we do. I see them as the result or the function after years and years of repetition. Our job is to prevent the ongoing repetition of what Alexander called habits of thought so that the postural mechanisms can write themselves. So I hope you find this interview interesting and enjoy. Hello, Anthony. Thank you for speaking with me today. Pleasure. Nice to be uh, here. Well, the reason that you're uh, that we're talking today is because in a previous video, John Doe used an image of you in a previous video that I've made with him, and we thought it'd be good for you to have a right of reply because you both have very different um, views on the Alexander technique and the work of FM Alexander. So we thought it would be useful for our people watching these videos to see both sides and to uh, come to their own conclusions. So I think most people watching this from the Alexander Technique world will know who you are, but can you give us a very quick overview of you, uh, what you do and your uh, general, over, uh, general uh, approach to the Alexander Technique? Yes, yes. Okay, so briefly, um, I trained um, in 1982 uh, in Jerusalem. Um, and pretty soon after I qualified in 1986, I came back to England and was within a year, I was invited to work at the Alexander Institute with Dr. Barlow and Marjorie Barlow, who were both trained by Alexander in 1932. Um, that was my private practice beginning in, in London. And then I started to teach a train in 1989 at um, Peter Rebo School and Misha Magidov School. And in 2004, I opened up my own school in central London. Um, my approach to Alexander, I think, is pretty classical. Uh, others might call it radical, uh, but I'll leave it to the viewer to make his or her own mind up. Um, my approach is psychophysical. I very strongly endorse Alexander's understanding of the self as a psychophysical self, uh, rather than what Alexander derogatory called um, um, posture or uh, physical culture. Uh, I'm very interested in the capacity of the Alexander technique for emotional healing as well as easing musculoskeletal uh, problems. And I love doing hands-on work. And at the same time, I'm not in such a, an opposite category to Jean Doe. I believe in the potential of hands-off work to deliver something of value. Okay, great. I can go into greater detail if you want me to explain why I think a, a certain approach to hands-on, hands-off work can have legitimate Alexander value without throwing away the baby with the bathwater. Okay, well, before we get to that, can you, so it, you, you could possibly say that there's one thing you and John, let's start with something you and John might actually agree on, as well as the, the possibility of doing hands-on. Uh, sorry, without hands. Um, there does seem to be kind of two, you could say two Alexander techniques. So there's what Alexander, FM Alexander was doing or taught himself in front of the mirror early on and some of his early pupils. 
And then there's what he moved to later with the hands on and, and that's what the training courses and, and uh, the Alexander Technique Worlds continued since then. But you yes. obviously both have different takes on yes. which is preferable. So can you talk yeah. about your understanding of the the difference between the two approaches and the two sort of the two techniques that um, yes. FM was involved yeah. in or invented? Yes. Yeah, so as an inventor, obviously there was there was no Alexander teacher to put hands on Alexander. So he worked all this out for himself in front of mirrors because um, he couldn't really rely on his own sense of what was going on. He found it was unreliable. It was inaccurate. And one of the main principles of Alexander to most of us today is that you can't rely on feelings as an accurate guide to what you're doing. So the use of mirrors was an essential part of Alexander's exploration. And initially, and as you know, Alexander had a background. He didn't suddenly come out of nowhere. He had a background in Delsart and other procedures. And um, he was a man of his time. And he developed his understanding of Alexander, as I said, not in a vacuum, but based on many other things that he was exploring and he was trained in. He, is a, he was a trained Delsart practitioner. And Delsart is more, you could say, more postural ergonomic, physical angles, positions, uh, than um, what later became known as the Alexander Technique hands-on, which according to some people's guesswork, he transitioned from a verbal instructional approach to guiding people in about 1907 to hands-on. And I'm sure it wasn't as clinically simple as that, but according to hearsay, Alexander was becoming more and more frustrated with the inadequacy of words, the inadequacy of words that he'd say, I want your neck to free up. I want your head to lift off the spine, I want you to lengthen, I want you to widen, I want your stature to expand. He'd say many words that were words based on his experience, but they weren't landing on the pupil in the way that he wanted them to land. And so he'd find himself saying words with all good conscience, with all good intentions, and not getting the right result. And as this frustration grew, apparently one day, and it may have happened over a series of days or weeks, he apparently said something like, no, 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 not like this, and rushed over to them and said like this. And he put his hands on them and, and manipulated them, adjusted them, gave them some sort of physical representation of the words he was trying to convey inadequately. And around about that time was what I think was the beginning of the hands-on approach of Alexander. Before that, the instructions or directions were hands-off Alexander, where he'd balk orders or directions from one corner of a room to another and hope that they would, as I said, hope they would land and effect changes in the right direction. Um, since that time, Alexander, as you say quite rightly, has, has been traditionally a, a training of hands-on uh, with verbal instruction at the same time, with guidance, with verbal guidance and explanation and conceptual guidance but primarily a hands-on tradition that carries on to this day. Um, but of course, there are those that feel there is still value in the pre-hands-on time of Alexander when he was exploring for many, many years the possibility of introducing change, effecting change in his pupils through uh, verbal instruction. And you said that you, you're now open to... Uh, teaching without hands. Can you explain a bit about how that works yeah. in the context of um, of uh, the modern Alexander technique? Yes. Uh, okay. So it is understood by pretty much anyone in the Alexander world today that when they're using hands-on work, the condition, the psychophysical condition of the Alexander teacher is the primary mover, is the prime influence in the interaction between teacher and pupil. If I'm in a state of disturbance that Alexander called misuse, my hands would convey a mess of misuse. They wouldn't facilitate effective, liberating change. If I'm in a better state of use and my mind body or my psychophysical self was in a better condition of use, my hands would then convey a more harmonious, 
liberating potential. So that's really a very, very important element to say. Alexander did not base his hands-on work based simply on the positions of the neck and back as a primary, as a primary enterprise. That was always secondary. The primary influence of an Alexander teacher is their use of self, their resonance, their way of being, the quality of their whole psychophysical organism in the interaction. So obviously the hands, if you shake hands with someone who's nervous, you'll pick it up from the hands. If someone gives you a hug and they're a little bit reticent, you'll feel it in the hug. In other words, we pick up a person's vibes, a person's quality through touch. Now here's the point, here's the point that I discovered was possible in non-hands-on work. If it's true that my being is communicated through touch, the question I'll, I'll ask here is, is it only communicated through touch? Are there other media? Is there another medium that can communicate the same essential Anthony? There's the question. And I answered my own question and I, understood that although touch is very obvious, I touch you and you get my quality through my hands, you're also getting it through another medium or other media. One is voice. If you spend time with a person who's got a very, in a very nervous disposition, a very nervous condition, their voice might start to irritate irk you, you'd pick up some of that nervousness, it would cross the divide. So the quality of voice, and we know that sound affects use, we know that. You listen to a beautiful symphony, it's going to melt you, open you, inspire you, enthuse you. We know that music heals, potentially. Certain music can be discordant and some music can soften and enrich and nourish the soul. So we know that sound is very, very important as a communication and voice as a representation of complex sound can convey use, use of self. It can't not. In other words, I can't convey anything other than who Anthony is at this particular time. If I'm nervous talking to you or angry talking to you or sad talking to you, something will come through my voice. So well, that's one way of communicating through non-touch. What else? Well, here we are looking at each other. The quality of my gestures, my facial gesture, the quality and essence of my facial being, my eyes communicate. And when you're sitting in front of somebody, you're influencing them and they're influencing you in this interactional event. And so if I'm maintaining the Alexander principle, and I believe it is a principle, that we communicate essentially through our use of self, then there is touch, there is voice, there is facial gesture, and there is movement gesture. Dance affects the self and the soul. Beautiful dance touches us deeply. So the eyes are also influenced as well as the ears, as well as touch. All of these organs of, of sensation, sense organs, convey use of self. So my way of working with non-touch is still with use of self and not with instructions to the body. Because instructions to the body are very, very open to multiple interpretations that I have no control over. If I can go one stage further, you ask two Alexander teachers, what do you understand by neck free, head forwards and up? And you'll probably come up with three versions. And if you ask a student on a training course, what do you understand by back lengthening and widening? The same problem, they're lovely words. And they may have been a description of Alexander's inner experience. But 
if you use them to convey an influence to change, to affect change, you're going to ask for all sorts of messy approximations to what a person wants. And secondly, and maybe this is even more important, I don't believe that the Alexander change is about positional or even relational change, although that will happen, but I don't believe that's the essence. I believe ch shape is a manifestation of an inner change, but the inner change is the change that is important. The change of open, the change of softness, the change of heart, the change of condition, the change of attention, the change, the change of alertness and engagement and relationship. And then the shape manifests a shift as a representation of this inner change. And I think Alexander, the further he went in his work, was interested in the inner change that was brought about through what he called inhibition or prevention of habitual patterns of thinking. So I'm okay, however, that is enabled. I've got no beef about anybody working in different ways as long as the essence of the change is communicated effectively. Excellent, thank you. Uh, you mentioned there about use of the self and the, the teacher's state affecting the pupil or you know, the teacher's as, is, as a model to the pupil. Um, so what, uh, how the, the, the title of the video that we in question was, was called What is Good Use? So how do you answer the question of what is good use? And how do you know, how do you judge if someone has good use or if you yourself has good use, whether you're a teacher, a pupil, or yes. someone working on their own? Yes. First of all, I think there's a, a lot of confusion about this term good use. And I think it's not clear. Most people, when they talk about misuse or use, they're talking about some sort of idealized shape. And Alexander didn't mean that by misuse or use. Use of self isn't some snapshot where you can say good use, bad use. So this isn't good use or bad use, it's just a shape. It may not be very effective, it may give me a neck ache, but it's not misuse. So what's misuse? Misuse from an Alexander perspective is how I react to the stimuli of living. How I react inside myself to the stimuli of living. So if you give me a, a rough time on Zoom right now, and I go, oh, Kevin, that's really, really bit unfair of you to ask me that question. That is a reaction. In that millisecond or five seconds, that is me reacting to the stimulus of your difficult question by freezing and bracing and getting disturbed. Then I calm down and I realize actually, Kevin, you're quite a nice guy. I'm okay with your question. I'll calm down again and I'll open up again. And I'm not under the influence of a stimulus that evokes a reaction. So which second, when you say this person has use, good use or bad use, the, the whole questioning is wrong. It's, it's an insult. A person doesn't have good use or bad use. You have to ask the real question, how do we react to the stimuli of living? And let's be honest, we all react sometimes to the stimuli of living by being triggered, by reacting. None of us are beyond reaction if you push us hard enough, or that happens to be a trigger for me and not for you. I will react. After 35 years of doing Alexander, yes, I will often react. I've got two kids, nine and 10. Yes, you should see me in the living room downstairs when they push my buttons. Yes, I react. Hopefully I recover a bit quicker and hopefully I react a little bit less. But react, yes, I do, because I'm human. And so I don't think use and good use should be terms of abuse or terms of crit critique or terms of I'm better than you. I find the term offensive because it doesn't encapsulate the truth of the human condition, which is we're all human, we all react and we're all struggling. We're all in the common boat of humanity and we're doing the best we can to live a fulfilled life and develop and grow as human beings. But the second we start pointing a finger, good use, bad use, 
There's an interesting question. The second I go, he's got bad use. Watch me. Watch my shape as a manifestation of Anthony inside. You've got bad use, Kevin. What does that finger poking attitude convey? First of all, I'm hurting myself in my finger poke. I'm giving myself a squashed neck. I'm raising my blood pressure. I'm raising my heart level. I'm doing I'm better than you. I'm arroganting myself. I'm turning you into a baddie. I'm elevating myself into a goodie. At the moment that I'm pointing the finger, I'm the example of misuse, not the point person I'm pointing my finger at. It's probably quite okay. His shape may not be like a painting, like a, a god, but he's okay. So I start my work by affirming that we're all in the same boat. That I'm fallible, a flawed human being. And I don't want to point out to anybody they've got misuse because I don't think it helps me and I'm pointing it out and I certainly know it doesn't help them. So I don't tell anybody they're wrong because they're not. So what they're doing, is, the best, doing the best they can. So what is the role of the teacher when, so when a pupil comes to you and they, they want to improve um, their use of the self, what is the... What is the correct role of the teacher in that, in your view? So how, how should they help the person uh, improve? And then how do you judge if they are improving? And how does the person learn to judge themselves if they're, Im if they're improving or not? Well, again, I hope they don't judge themselves. Because it's the judging of themselves that's the problem and not the solution. This self-judging, overly self-critical attitude. People are shamed enough. People are diminished enough without adding to the narrative of I'm not okay. So the first thing that happens when a person comes in and they've got a problem, a neck ache, a problem with their shoulder, problem with their overactive emotional states, what Alexander called emotional gusts, is to say, yes, okay, let's work with that, but not to shame them and not say, say it's misuse. And to give them the experience through my presence, maybe primarily through my hands if I'm working with hands on, that I'm not there to change them. I'm not there to correct them. I'm not there to diminish them or criticize them or to give themselves a standard by which to judge themselves by, but to actually affirm and to say to them, there's nothing you can do wrong in this room. There's nothing you can do wrong in this room and you're not wrong right now. You may be in pain and you may be suffering. You may be struggling. And that's the best you are doing under the influence of your stimuli. And my job is to help you manage those stimuli without reacting so much so that it might solve the, the problems. But it doesn't start off by self-judgment. It starts by self-acceptance. And you support self-acceptance by the teacher accepting the pupil and not by giving them some idealistic standards by which to, to self-judge, to self-criticize, to self-diminish, to self-shame, to feel bad, because that takes them in the opposite direction. And that's something they know very well since they're little. They're not good enough, they're not lovable enough. So they come to an Alexander teacher and the teacher carries on the same game you're not good, you've got misuse, let's improve. It's the same old drama. The job of an Alexander teacher is to give a different experience, a different experience to one they've had since there were two or before. And the experience that Alexander talked about, the different experience, the different psychophysical experience, is to be in the presence of a teacher who doesn't shame and blame, who doesn't tell you, you need to improve your use of self but to affirm who you are, to accept and to non-judge and to be compassionate, to embrace. That is the route to radical change, not criticism, criticism self-denigration, self-flagellation. That's a route to more of the same, more struggle, more conflict, 
more I'm not good enough. The teacher knows everything. I know nothing. I've got to be better. I've got to make my neck freer. I've got to make my head go forwards and up. I wish it did. It's not. I've try, I'll try harder. The trying mind and the unhappy mind is the problem and not the solution. And the teacher has to give a level of kindness that offers the student or pupil a radically different experience, a radically different experience to their everyday. And that is the promoter of change. Radical acceptance promotes radical change. So based on the video that uh, Jean Doe made, um, he is, he sh he sh I'll leave, there'll be a link for people underneath, but he's showing images of people and he's analyzing the positions of parts geometrically and using that as a criterion for uh, good use. So do you see any value at all in, in visual um, of the teacher analyzing the visual structure of the person and using that to um, help the person learn what movements to make or, or how to um, uh, change their use? I don't think that changes the use in the way I'm using the term use. It might change shape and it might change posture. There are many postural systems out there. You know, the ballet dancers have a postural system where they imagine their head is a, a, a balloon. I've heard even Alexander people saying, you know, lift upwards and they go like this, lift upwards. And, you know, the, the people in the army have their own postural game, their shoulders back, tummy in. And yes, everyone has their own postural games. Is there value in it? I don't even need to comment. What I can say is that the Alexander technique for me is not about angles and positions where you're told that's wrong and that's right and you need to improve because the whole feedback loop of you need to improve and that's not good enough for me already sets the mind body into a condition of conflict of I don't have it now and I need to try to get it and for me that promotes what Alexander called end gaining the desire to change without having the means to change it the efforting of the mind to improve because it doesn't feel enough or okay and that efforting to improve when we, when we come from a place of feeling diminished, for me, causes conflict in the mind body and not ease and harmony. And so I wouldn't want to tell a person that their angle is wrong. People come with all sorts of shapes and sizes. And I don't want to shame anybody by saying you're five degrees off. Five degrees off what? Who's standard? And that's why in the video that you're talking about, when I was snapshotted doing something, even though my face was blanked out, one of my students contacted me and said, do you know that you're being used in a video? I said, no, are you happy? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I'm still happy that I can be used in, on some level. I wanted the opportunity of talking about what it means. So can we go a bit further with that particular shot? So, and this is the difference between what Alexander called mechanical advantage and use of self. Mechanical advantage, by the way, that's what Alexander called an improved condition at the beginning of his work, positions of mechanical advantage. And he gave a few photographs of these. Positions of mechanical advantage is, is, is real, and I, I, I honor that. For most of the time, if I'm lifting up a heavy bag, I'll want to bend my knees, my back will reason, want to be reasonably lengthened, and I'll probably carry the, the, uh, the object quite close to my body to maximize my mechanical advantage. When I'm playing tennis, I'll probably want to be in a classic monkey position. Makes sense. If I'm skiing and I don't know how to get into a, an organized monkey position, that would be very ineffective skiing. So there are positions of the mechanic of mechanical advantage that are of tremendous importance for effective functioning. But that is not use of self. And I'll explain to you why. Most Alexander teachers will say, and not just the, the hands-off team, that this, when the head goes back and down, this is misuse. And I'll say, not necessarily. Why am I saying that? And I'll explain. 
this is a position we can both agree is mechanically disadvantageous. Agreed? If I do it for a little while, it's going to hurt me. It's not comfortable. But right now I'm doing it on purpose. I'm playing. If I asked you a question, is my nervous system disturbed when I do this? Is my heart rate increasing when I do this? Am I getting upset when I do this? You'd say to me, you look like you're pretty okay with it. And you don't look to me as if you're disturbed. So I will say it's a position of mechanical disadvantage, but it's not misuse. It's not misuse because misuse is a psychophysical construct, which indicates the disturbance of the psychophysical organism. So I'll give you one example. Alexander was trying to explain this to his students in class. And he asked the student to come over and put their hands on his wrist. And he turned to the class and started shouting, what are you doing? Get out of here. You're making a tremendous mess of yourselves. You know, showing a huge tantrum rage. And he then turned to these students and said, now tell me, has my pulse increased? No. He said, that's good use. How could it be good use when he's doing this and this? Because his psychophysical organism was not disturbed. That is the highest level of Alexander. That whatever shape you're in, and by the way, sometimes life demands some pretty complicated, unadvantageous shapes. Try doing a top spin serve in tennis without arching your back and pulling your head backwards. Not, not possible. Can it be done with good use? Look at Federer. <laughs> Look at the top tennis players. That's good use. Why? Because they're not reacting with strain, with distortion and disturbance. And if they stayed in that position for long, it would be rather uncomfortable. And maybe if they do it rather a lot, as professional tennis players, they might even get back problems. Plenty of them do. So what's misuse? Misuse is when the brain waves, the nervous system, the biochemicals, the hormonal system, the breath are all participating in a disturbance of the organism. But when one element of the organism is doing something, without all the rest, you cannot call it misuse because misuse is a, a total construct. It involves the total psychophysical organism. So even though this is not very comfortable, a funny position. I, I can be snapshots when I'm like this. It is not misuse. For you, what's the relationship uh, between reasoning and feeling? So, you know, Alexander talks a lot in his early books about whether you uh, do things, you act according to your reason or whether you just do things habitually by feeling. Fantastic um, what, question. So yeah. how, how, do, how do you view that? Um, obviously, in John Doe's videos, he has a particular interpretation of that, um, which is he's applying in the videos. So can you talk a bit about your understanding of what Alexander means and how you use that? Very much so. I use it a lot. So where does reason take place? It takes place in the cortex. And Alexander was very, very passionate about the ability to what he said remain in contact with reason, in contact with reason, not the intellect, but with reason. What did he mean by in contact with reason? When he was talking about reason, it was in the context of emotional, what he called emotional gusts. Have you come across that term? Emotional gusts, when people would have a temper tantrum, by the, by the way, Alexander was well known for having lots of temper tantrums when he was younger. You probably have heard about that. It's not a, a secret. And he wasn't a god. And he wasn't beyond reaction. So he had tantrums, especially if an animal or a horse was being abused. 
he would fly into a rage. And he called those events emotional gusts. And he said when he was in an emotional gust, he was out of touch with reason, which means he saw red. He couldn't think. He would just go around whatever he was doing, having a rage attack. And we know, most of us have had rage, that when you're in the middle of rage, you literally see red, you can't think. You're out of touch with reason. For Alexander, and he wrote this after the First World War, he was very passionate at the idea of the human condition. Mankind could recover the ability to stay in touch with reason rather than unreason. Now, that is the essence of use. If I'm constantly overreacting by multiple emotional gusts all day, I'm out of touch with my reason all day. And that's not healthy because all sorts of destructions can take place when I'm out of touch with reason. And for Alexander, the ability of the technique to help the psychophysical organism recover its harmony, its embodiment, its mindfulness, where I'm back in touch with my reason, was for, for Alexander one of the supreme potentials of the work that I would recover my higher self, my better self, when I'm not at the mercy of emotional gusts, not at the mercy of emotional gusts. So in Alexander's terminology, emotional gusts is when you're out of touch with reason. And what he called constructive conscious control, which is a description of when one is just available to think, to be, to act from a level of embodiment without the habits of distortion, the habits of thinking that take us out of reason. And that recovery of reason is one of the aims of the Alexander Technique, the ability to have, it, to have a brain that's connected to my heart and connected to my gut and not to be overtaken by instinct. What's the relationship between uh, use of the self, um, constructive conscious control, and your own verbal speech, your, uh, whether it's outer spoken speech, uh, self speech, you know, you're, everyone talks to themselves all day long. What's the relationship between, between this and use of the self and movement and action in general? So when we develop capacities, and this is what Alexander lessons are all about, they're developing capacities, capacities of coming back home, what Alexander called inhibition, and the back is staying back away from the dramas, when we're not overly pulled out of ourselves into reactions and emotional gusts, and we lose our reason. When we're more able to stay back from the dramas, of entanglement, when we're able to not react to the powerful stimuli of life and stay in touch with reason and to stay embodied. This improved use of self or the decrease in reactivity increases the functioning of every single component of the human organism. Movement, digestion, sleep, muscle tone, thinking. All of the functions of the human organism, the functions are influenced by use of self. So an overreactive use of the self would diminish or impact on all of the functions of the human organism. So misuse or overuse or reactive use can cause ill health in a number of different functional arenas. It could be my eyesight, it could be my jaw locking, it could be my breath, it could be my digestion, it could be my skin, it could be my relational patterns, it could be the quality of my movement and the capacity to pay attention. 
and keep my eye on the ball. All of those areas are functions and they are all influenced by use of self. So the job of an Alexander teacher isn't to teach functions, not to teach me how to breathe or when to blink or how to digest or how to move or what shape my neck and back should be in, but teach me not to react to the stimuli of living so that all of those functions, including posture and breath and quality of movement, can be impacted by my gradual improving quality of staying back from my dramas and being able to handle the stimuli of everyday living. Can you explain again, please, your, because uh, it was interesting, your explanation, you said earlier about the use of the self and mechanical advantage being uh, separated, being different things. Um, can you talk a bit more about that, please? Because that was that's very different from what John Doe's talking about, and I think it's really useful for people to be able to contrast the, your two uh, different understandings. If that's okay. Yes, yes. So is the question, how do I contrast use of self with mechanical advantage? Yes. Do you, do you just think mechanical advantage is something that he did thought about early on so that like this kind of reasoning about mechanical movements and positions is one thing and then how, how does my what is mechanical advantage later on in the in this like second technique of alexander's the the um yes. modern way it seems like when i read the books it seems like there's a an evolution of the language of mechanical advantage to a, a different sort of language over the 20 30 years of his writing of the books and that evolution seems to indicate that primarily when he was starting out, he was interested in angles and positions and ergonomics and postures and mechanical advantage. And that gradually and deeply, he came to an experiential recognition that the primary aspects of the teaching was much more about the self that reacts or doesn't react. And so use of the self became more his go-to term rather than mechanical advantage. And by use of self, he was always interested in the whole psychophysical organism's way of responding to life events, both internally and externally. And so I do see quite a shift of language we see much less talk about positions of mechanical advantage in the late books, much more about that sort of thing in the early books. Um, but in classic Alexander teaching, most teachers are in, interested in offering mechanical advantage uh, and not simply improving use of self. And I think there's quite a range in the Alexander world where you might spend a bit more time on mechanical advantage and a bit more time on use of self. I'm a bit more interested in use of self than mechanical advantage, um, although it's impossible not to learn about mechanical advantage when you become more sensorially aware. Your body starts to tell you that's not very advantageous. So I think mechanical advantage is probably a, by a very good byproduct of improving use of self, because when you don't react so much to the stimuli of living, your mind body becomes more sensitive to the things it does to itself over and, time. And how related to this, how do you, what's your definition of uh, a, a troublesome phrase for most people, psychophysical unity? What does that, what does that mean to you? Yes, well, that was a, not a bad term 100 years ago, quite revolutionary, really. Today, you probably use terms like the mind body or the body mind or the total self, or being. We talk about embodied qualities today. We talk about mindfulness. that includes an embodied quality of mindfulness. That actually our terminology isn't very psychophysical. And I think Alexander was trying to grapple with the truth that he could not separate mind from body. And that gesture, and postural patterns were just part of a tapestry of being human. And reaction 
is a psychophysical construct. This is so important that reaction to stimuli is a psychophysical construct. He was often asked, well, what is the technique? And one of my favorite answers from him is something like this. He said, the technique is about learning not to react to the habits of living that put you wrong. Which is very different to, I want your neck to be at an angle of X amount of degrees to your thoracic spine. But how do you cope with the demands of living? And can we help you cultivate capacities that you can go through the ups and downs of life without too much disturbance or with less disturbance? that you can actually manage the demands without losing touch with reason, without losing selfhood, without diminishing yourself, without causing too many psychophysical problems. Because I don't see any difference between a, a person coming in with a neck ache and a shoulder ache, or not feeling okay in their emotional world. This psychophysical organism is anything that a person presents that is a result of patterns of distortion and disturbance because life is overwhelming. And that's the way I see the technique. What happens when life is overwhelming? What happens when life is overwhelming, usually when we're little, is we create habits and patterns to cope. And then they show up later on in life as functional problems, voice problems, pain, irritation. And the job of an Alexander teacher isn't to fix the problem, the symptom, but see if they can sort out the condition of the organism that was overwhelmed at a certain point in time and help them deal with it in a different way without the overwhelm. You mentioned um, people pick up habits when they're young earlier. Uh, what's your uh, viewpoint on, on children and use of the self? Is this something we come into the world um, good, or for want of a better phrase, or is it something that's developed later? How do, you, how do you see all that? Because people talk about this a lot. Yeah. I'm no expert on embryology, but my gut feeling tells me that there's an influence on the growing organism from the moment of conception, maybe even before that, in the mind, body, realities of the mother, father. But what does seem quite plausible is that the growing baby, the growing fetus, is under the influence of impressions and patterns from very, very early on. The mode of delivery of the baby is going to be an event that may be either traumatic or not so traumatic. The quality of parenting, the quality of upbringing, the consistency of parenting, the traumas that may happen in early childhood, the overwhelm overwhelming qualities of certain stimuli of living, feeling rejected or abandoned or abused. I think these early traumatic events set up the individual to develop certain habits of coping, certain response to trauma and distress and adverse emotional conditions that create what Alexander called habits. What are habits? Habits are when the organism says, this is too hot to handle. I don't wanna be here anymore. And so we fly off into an Alexander habit. Anything that is difficult to stay home, embodied, that moves us away from being embodied is a strategy or a, a way of coping that becomes habitual because it's the best we can do in an intolerable situation where there was no one there for us to listen and be there for us while we're going through the struggle. So we do the best we can do. We either shrink or we aggress or we collapse in despair 
or we put a brave face on things and I'm fine, or we do all sorts of things. We end game because being here is so painful, so we have to go out there to everybody else's business. We jump out of our skins every five seconds because being in within our skins is too painful. These become habitual. And it's for no Alexander teacher to say, you're stupid, you're naughty, it's misuse. How silly of you, just stop it. Or here's a way to stop it. But to appreciate that behind every single element of misuse, there's a narrative, there's a story of distress that needs to be understood and compassionately witnessed. Without that, I don't believe there's any real healing. There's just shifting of one symptom to somewhere else. But radical healing in the Alexander work can't come from blame. It comes from understanding that so-called habits are the best way that the organism can manage an unmanageable and overwhelming reality. So I think habits are actually friends. They got me to today. So I honor them and I value them and I don't try and get rid of them. Um, well, here's another big uh, topic. It would be interesting to hear your take on this. Uh, people often, new pupils will often say things like if they come, if they're coming with some kind of psychophysical problem, they'll often say something like, uh, once they start learning, when did it all go wrong for people? At what point in history did did it go wrong? What's your take on that? Did it go wrong? When did it go wrong? Why did it go wrong? Well, there's all sorts of hypotheses, aren't they? From original sin to the evolutionary hypothesis of industrialization and urbanization and electronification. I think you can have any theory you like and where things so-called went wrong. I think it's better to dwell on the individual rather than to have philosophies about society. I'm not um, a sociologist. They've got all sorts of ideas about what's the better life from different economic models to different religious models. Any of those models, as Alexander would say, are useless unless the individual can rise to a different condition and we can actually implement these truths into the educational system, into the political system, into the social system, of non-trying, of acceptance, of non-shaming, and so on and so forth. So where did we all go wrong? The question really is, what can I do? And what can we do in this Alexander world to support ourselves, to help ourselves to heal? One of the most important things that Alexander wrote about was not to evoke the fear reflexes, not to evoke the fear reflexes. He said, if the fear reflexes are evoked in an Alexander session, no learning takes place, no learning on any school. And I take that as a, as a signpost for everything I want to do in the Alexander work. And so when a person from the second a person calls me up or walks through the door, I don't want to excite their fear reflex. So I won't tell them they need to be different, that they need a freer neck, that they need a better spine, that they need to improve. But quite the contrary. To, they're used to fear reflexes being excited. They're used to teachers saying they're not good enough. They need, they're used to self-help books telling them they've got to improve. But that's the problem and not the solution. I'm interested in shifting an attitude of, I've got to improve this desperate sense of self-improvement, which is really quite oppressive. You know, the self-help brigade is quite an oppressive brigade if you're not careful, because it's always saying to you, There's, you've got to be more than who you are. You've got to strive to be better. And every time you do that, you're saying to yourself, I'm not OK. I'm not good enough. The goodness is out there. It's in the guru. It's in the teacher. It's somewhere else. But nothing of value in here. And so I'm much more interested in not exciting that reflex of fear and not good enough. But to the contrary to give a person a new experience where they're okay with themselves, where they can live within their own skins. And I want to hold their hand while they're re-experiencing the truth of their broken hearts, the truth of their historical need for defensiveness, the truth of those moments where they couldn't cope without 
shutting off and going off into mind wanderings and attention deficits and to help them come back, which may be painful by the way. I don't think Alexander's a picnic, that's a whole other story. I don't think Alexander's a simple picnic of happiness and poise and freedom. Alexander's a way of coming back home and sometimes coming back home to an embodied self can mean re-experiencing and touching parts of our soul that will bleed, that will cry, and that will feel again from being cut off. So if I have been cut off and I have been a mind wanderer and I have been dissociating, coming back to an Alexander embodied self may involve, will involve an experience that previously I wouldn't have been able to manage, but today I hope I would be able to manage it more effectively with a guide. And I think that's often the teacher-pupil relationship, if it's safe enough, that the pupil can be encouraged and supported to return to feeling and experiencing rather than being cut off through the habits of end gaining and dissociating and compressing and concentrating and all the habits that Alexander was talking about, which are simply evidences of being at home is too much to handle. And our work is coming back home, coming back home. That's use of self. Can we reside back in our mind's bodies without the need for the habitual patterns of away from home, of loss of home. And that's a journey. And it's a journey I think is very valuable, probably the most valuable journey I've experienced in this life. And I think it's something that the Alexander Technique offers as a potential, the journey back home. Excellent, thank you, Anthony. I think that's may maybe a nice place for us to stop today, unless there's anything else you want to uh, talk about. No, we can always do another one if people are interested. Sure, so this has been really useful for uh, me and I'm sure for other people as well to see the, the contrast between you and John Doe. And some things are very different and some things, some places you actually agree on some things. So Good. thank you very much, Anthony, this has been fun.